Yeah, so um, very happy to see you all. It's probably one of my first conference-like situations after uh, COVID, I mean physical. So I'm a little bit scared about all of this. Let's see how it works. Okay, so as uh, Kuhn already sensed, the title is a little bit, um, well, strange. So it's about making sense of the world, right? And indeed, as, as Kuhn also correctly sensed, um, it's about using our comfort zone to basically say maybe more people could make sense out of the world, a little bit more like us, right? So, I mean, if you, if you think about QAnon or about anti-vaxxing or uh, about the general pattern of stupidity that you have with the don't look up, movie, right? So you really wonder how to make sense out of the world, right? Uh, so as a pro sciencer, so to say, I mean, I, I seem to have my, my methods, right? But as we all know, uh, they don't generally work, right? So we need to try to uh, improve things. Or if we, if we think about the other geopolitical problem that we have, right? I mean, I recently started to get a little bit obsessed with reading books about history. And I mean, all of us do a lot of doom scrolling and, uh, you know, try to understand, didn't we see this coming? Wasn't there enough uh, evidence written down in, in Russian propaganda and RT and everywhere? Isn't it super well known that, you know, propaganda is successful? I mean, so, you know, again, it's sort of, very disappointing, right? That as scientists, we uh, have sort of failed to uh, predict this, right? Or the society has failed to predict this, or our politicians have failed to, you know, hand, uh, act in a reasonable way. But yeah, so so this is uh, this is how uh, software knowledge analytics enters the scene, and it's really trying to re-explain it in a way uh, that, you know, we see how we make sense of the world and maybe, you know, people smarter than me uh, will improve politics, will improve uh, religion, will improve um, history, yeah, to, to better, you know, steer this world. But, you know, this is a little bit uh, strange way to start more. More to the point, uh, what is software knowledge analytics? I mean, obviously I made up this term, uh, but it's not completely surprising, or um, I think most people would correctly predict what it means. Um, I see it sort of as the intersection between software reverse engineering, uh, mining software repositories, program comprehension on one side. I mean, these are things that are very similar in themselves, right? Um, and then on the other side, I inject uh, knowledge engineering, right? Um, so just just a quick test. I mean, how many people here in the room don't have a programming language or software engineering background? Okay, so that, that makes it easy. So th there was no hands up. So, okay, so you guys know what I'm reading about and reading those definitions of those fields if you if you don't feel very familiar with some of them uh i think you know what i'm talking about so here's a brief history of time um so this is how i understand how software knowledge analytics has emerged so like in 1970s we started with program language theory like we really have a mathematical approach, uh, an algebraic, a uh, logic approach to understanding uh, syntax and semantics. And then, I, I mean, uh, even earlier people already understood how to write some, some form of interpreter or compiler. But then like in the 80s, people started to realize that they need a lot of programming language processors, right? So that they uh, started with some sort of generative approach or some sort of uh, domain specific uh, approach like very early systems, something like uh, TXL, for example. Um, so this this made it easy to uh, implement language analysis and transformations, right? Important step. 
then I don't know, I, I put 1990 there, empirical software engineering started, right? A more scientific approach to software engineering, you know, hypothesis, methodology, research questions, theory, validation. Um, and then um, in 2000, we started with software language engineering. What's the innovation there is we, we got a more general view on, on the uh, notion of language and technical space behind it. So it's not so much different whether you build a language processor in a meter model based way or on a grammar based way. And also even if you use JSON or XML, in the end it's always about uh, languages, their definition, their implementations, uh, support by analysis and transformation. Um, and then around 2000, we started with the mining software repositories field um, yeah, that's that's probably scientific approach to analyzing projects. I mean, before this, people were sort of maybe uh, cherry picking projects in order to sometimes validate their claims. But like with the MSR field, which also took advantage of the increase of open source, right? Um, this became much more scientific, right? And then I put 2008 there. Um, for software language science, I call it. I mean, I think of people like Stefan Hannenberg, for example, right, who started to apply empirical software engineering, if you like, in a language context, right? Um, and then uh, the term that's probably the least familiar here in the room, but one of my favorite terms, linguistic software architecture. I put that 2010. What is the... Uh, innovation there. It's about conceptualized representation of software projects. You know, rather than talking about ASTs or exchange formats and specific language, uh, we try to raise the level of abstraction and uh, basically start started defining ontologies of software projects, software languages, um, software technologies. And then uh, 2015, uh, I put knowledge graphs there. I mean, logic was used um, for a long time. I even remember your thesis. I mean, logic programming played a very important role in there. And it's a while ago. Um, no, but I mean, uh, with knowledge graphs, um, we really reached a new quality because, uh, again, we, we, we reached a more ontological level and uh, a level where we would more strongly integrate different data sets extracted from different artifacts and really make them more semantic data-like rather than, you know, um, uh, sort of obscure data. So this is, this is sort of the timeline that I have in mind. And the rest of the presentation, and we plan for a bio break. Uh, you, you tell me when to do a bio break, right? Um, it will cover like showcases of uh, software knowledge analytics. I will propose some principles and I will also um, enumerate some challenges. So it's it's like a oh this is this is a typo. It was actually supposed to be a methodological, but maybe <laughs> methodological <laughs> is maybe also okay. I don't know. So small accident. Um, yeah. So so it's it's basically trying to have a little bit broader view on on software knowledge analytics broader than within a specific community like MSR, right? And, um, yeah, so these are the showcases that I picked. Um, something about software language usage. Well, let's get started. So software language usage. Um, so particular example we, we worked on uh, recently, we tried to understand uh, graph-related query languages. I mean, so this is new stuff, right? Also because of uh, basically knowledge graphs and all this, uh, increasingly people program with graph query languages. And um, we had some research activities where we supported language integration for these graph query languages. So we wanted to do graph queries within uh, programming language syntax, right? And so, therefore, we try to understand, okay, where is this all going, right? What, what query languages should we look into? Um, uh, you know, what is their, what's the, what's, what happens on the timeline, right? Are they getting more popular? 
and also more deeply what are people doing with them within you know their projects um, so this is what we this is what we try to understand so we had some methodology that I skip here how we define the target languages I mean we wanted to cover obviously the important graph query languages this is uh, this is what we arrived with and we also in order to sort of um, challenge the methodology very well knowing that there's actually not that much graph query language evidence out there we also picked some other query languages for which we knew that they are quite omnipresent right just to have some baseline um, yeah so this is a uh, graph query I mean in GraphQL um, well just to give an example but it doesn't really matter so we found this number of projects uh, exercising the different graph query languages um, and so this is basically in all of github as usually and then actually for fun we also saw whether they actually are mixed in, in, in the projects because this could actually be a um, interesting indicator right if you have some sort of generic project that um, supports multiple query languages but more importantly then we looked at um, the project count over time um, for the different um, for the different graph query languages and I mean we could spend some time on trying to understand some of these uh, timestamps here what happens there had to do with actually when the language was introduced when a standard was available when uh, uh, um, uh, implementation was freely available when a new version came out and stuff like this so obviously things happen around that time so but then we wanted to see um, so basically we want to see how many activities are going on in those projects uh, related to the query language right I mean because just because there's some query language code in some project doesn't mean that people are using a lot right so and as you see uh, actually so we lumped up uh, all the stuff in 120 days windows so actually you see you know until 2019 uh, there's actually not too much going on in github projects with regard to these uh, query languages anyways we tried to nail it down we tried to find good examples interesting use cases of uh, graph query language usage by saying okay um, ideally the the project would engage with some specific uh, domain right it would it would engage with a specific schema or with, with specific instance data you know then it would really do some you know specific uh, querying um, meta would be that they are already at the um, meta level because they would somehow um, use uh, you know generic uh, queries and then uh, there are even projects that are essentially just implementing graph query languages right so they are irrelevant and so so we we labeled like I mean we did a very strong selection like I mean filtering to to get rid of things that are not so uh, popular or not so important and so we ended up labeling like 75 repositories and as you see there were only like 12 projects left where we would see that something interesting is going on with uh, graph query languages okay um, yeah there's there's some details about this in the paper um, but yeah that's just one example so different showcase this time not about language usage but about technology usage so the technology I picked here is EMF. EMF, I mean, some of you might not know EMF. It's Eclipse Modeling Framework. It's basically a wonderful technology. You give it a meter model, push a button, get some ugly Java code, right? Um, it's actually not a wonderful technology. It's a terrible technology. It sort of uh, has many different idioms. Uh, you can do all kind of stuff with it. Nobody really understands it completely. So what do you want to do? You want to understand the patterns of its usage, right? I mean, naive approach is, okay, you look at some EMF project and you go and see, ah, I understand, this is the meta model, this is, uh, this is the generator model, this is the generated code, uh, ah, there's a factory class for the classes that correspond to the uh, meta model and so on, so you, you, you develop some mental model, right? So, and so, 
I will say a little bit more about how we actually find these pattern instances because there's some logical reasoning involved that's sort of cool. But here just an overview of uh, all the pattern instances that we found on GitHub. Um, so we distinguished um, like the very basic pattern that an e-core e based meta model is uh, present. Then J means like, oh, there's also the generated code there. Um, and then, yeah, so there's also there's also one-to-one -one correspondence we can establish by, by comparing the meta model elements like classes in the meta model with the uh, generated classes, right? And then there's all kinds of other situations, like for example, apparently one e-core meta model, but uh, two Java packages, so sort of weird situation. Um, yeah, so how did, we, um, how did we find all these patterns? Um, so we used a logic-based approach here. So basically we start from very basic patterns that just uh, represent the file system, right? And so in this case, uh, we have some package.java file, which is a file, and some uh, ecore file, which is a file, right? And so we use a knowledge graph-based approach, and then we use rules to actually uh, um, um, infer more triples, right? So basically here it says, well, if you have some file with extension Java, then uh, make it um, element of Java, right? Okay. Or here, if you have something that has ecore in a file name, uh, then uh, state that it's an element of the ecore meta modeling language, right? Or here, um, um, we want to know basically what sort of language is defined by the meta model. Right? So, okay, we exploit the fact that you can look into the file and somewhere uh, with some XPath like uh, fact extraction, you can find the namespace declaration in the equal file that sort of gives the name to the language, which you then, uh, by this rule, also get into this knowledge graph. Right? Similarly, there's also a place somewhere in the package.java file which also records that namespace, and by extracting it from there, and by comparing it ultimately with the uh, namespace from the eCore file, uh, we know that, or we assume that the that two artifacts correspond to each other. Of course, we can um, we can apply stronger checks, like we can also check, as I said before, like that all the meta model elements seem to correspond to all the classes in the Java context. But yeah, that's sort of how it works. Uh, simple uh, knowledge graph uh, and logic based approach. Um, yeah, and there is, of course, a paper that goes with it, just so that you know. Um, now, uh, another showcase. So this is about software developer profiling. So it's basically trying to understand what software developers uh, do in terms of, you know, uh, in this case, what APIs or what API domains they are, they are good in or they are exercising, right? So, well... We don't know whether they're good in it, okay? But let's say we can look at what they are exercising. So this is this is how we first uh, look at the project as a whole, right? We see, okay, in the different packages of the project, different APIs are used, and they correspond to different domains of these APIs. And now we can also use a uh, similar uh, kind of view and can look at the different developers and can uh, see how their API-related uh, profiles correspond to each other. Um, and that's, of course, a very pragmatic approach, but then, more interestingly, we can pose these research questions, right? I mean, first of all, obviously, we would like to maybe um, abstract from the very specific APIs, because, you know, um, we assume that a developer can easily switch from one XML API to the other. Um, so, then it's also interesting to understand whether developers are really specializing, right? Do they specialize? I mean, can we show that? Um, that is, how dissimilar are these API profiles across developers? Um, of course, it might just be that the API profiles are just an artifact of the tasks uh, that the developers addressed. So, therefore, we should also ask how stable are these API 
profiles over time, right? Are these developers really specializing in some way or maybe constrained by the project or otherwise that there is some sort of stable API profile? Because if that would be the case, um, we could actually um, use those profiles for something, right? I mean, such as bug assignment. I mean, bug assignment, bug comes in, we know something about the bug, the nature of the bug, affected files, relevant APIs, right? And then based on the um, profile, we might be able to do bug assignment. Or, you know, uh, we, we might uh, even hire people on these grounds, right? Okay. Um, and this is actually something uh, I, I hope your smart students can help me with, because this is sort of... A some unfinished work in this context. Uh, I'm a little bit stuck. I need some um, intelligent people to look into this. Okay. Uh, uh, another showcase. So this is, um, I call it work item prediction. That's something I worked on at Facebook uh, not too long ago. Um, so this is also about understanding what developers are doing, but not so much in terms of what APIs they are using, what technologies they are using, but rather on what work item they are working. I mean, work items such as a certain bug, a certain task, a certain feature, something, you know, that we know someone should be working on at some point in time, right? And why is this interesting? I mean, it's this time it's not so much about spying on the specific developer. Um, I mean, that we, we can also do that, right? But, uh, but it's, it's, it's maybe more about also building some knowledge base here. So, for example, um, assume... Uh, we have a certain type of alert and we want uh, the right person to respond to this alert or we want to help someone who is new on the job with telling the person what sort of activities should be applied in order to address the alert, right? So we sort of want to aggregate automatic documentation that tells us, okay, if this type of alert comes in, you should maybe read that sort of documentation or you need to do that sort of uh, database query or something. But the problem is um, this documentation must be automatic because nobody takes the effort of, uh, you know, writing it. So, but this means that we need to know for any given engineer uh, what they are working on. So, so I'm engineer X and I'm working on my new feature, actually a bunch of them, because I'm waiting for code review, so I'm blocked, so I'm working on a bunch of them, and then also I work on some alerts because I'm on the call, so I'm switching uh, all the time back and forth between different work items, so knowing what activities relate to what a work item is actually a hard problem. So here's another um, scenario why you want to predict work items. Um, I call this the aggregate performance scenario. It also has to do with what people call key performance indicators, right? So um, we, want to, we want to know how much time does, in average, uh, let's say, for example, a developer spend on uh, a diff, I mean, commit, yeah, or a feature or whatever. Um, so obviously, in order to do this, we should again record all the time spent on this particular work item. Um, and so, again, the challenge is to know when someone is working on something. All right. So, so what we do here is um, we we struggle with what we call dark matter. Um, so this is the timeline of a developer, right? And so for many things, uh, we know exactly what a developer is working on. Like when 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 I publish a diff in my code review system, obviously at that very moment I'm working on that diff or the task that's linked with this diff. Wonderful, right? Um, and I publish another diff and it's a different work item, so it's easy, right? And here, I mean, I review a diff and again it's easy, right? Um, especially when I submit the review. Um, now there are other activities that are not so easy but they are still quite doable, like for example, um, I might be doing some local commits on my machine. I'm preparing basically maybe work on different features. Um, but, you know, we can still associate this with, let's say, a diff or commit or a feature by sort of backwards going in the history and seeing, okay, this code that was uh, changed here uh, eventually ended up in this diff. Okay, so probably this belongs together. Uh, but there are activities, and this is what I call dark matter, that are a little bit more tricky. Um, so, so I again, I work on several features and I work on several alerts and God knows. Um, 
And then I do some, uh, I query some database, right, here. Or I read some internal documentation. Um, so what does this count towards uh, to, all right? I mean, it's not so easy to know. I mean, we all have ideas how to do this, right? Maybe some NLP stuff or um, feature location kind of uh, stuff, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy, right? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And uh, obviously what you end up doing is you use some heuristics, you use some machine learning um, to build a probabilistic model in the sense that you can probabilistically uh, link um, these different activities on a timeline with um, uh, work items, right? That's, that's what you need to do. And uh, I can maybe in one of the lectures, I can say a little bit more about this. Uh, it's, it's really not so straightforward. It's certainly not in practice because uh, work items are not first class citizens in the tool sometimes or in, in the, you know, um, so they are not locked consistently. Uh, the tools are often not fully integrated, right? So we really have to do some recovery here. Uh, and developer workflow is unstructured, as I said, right? They are switching. Um, yes, and um, and that's actually interestingly. This is this is very comparable to what people have found in process mining context, right? There's the notion of process unaware systems, um, systems that ideally, you know, should follow some uh, process model, but they are not, and, you know, the uh, case IDs, as, as they call them, are not readily available, so that's very similar. So just to give you an idea, this is the timeline of a developer, a, a few hours, and, you know, this is what they are, this is the timeline, and they are really switching back and forth between different work items, in this case, diffs, uh, and you see there's even things here that we don't know, right? I mean, this has happened probably a long time ago, and now they are finalized here. Actually, they are abandoned, so it happens. Um, so, so you cannot just use uh, time proximity, uh, and you can also not just use these high confidence I activities. You really need to figure out this dark matter stuff. So that's this um, this uh, showcase, and um, there's a paper that goes with it. And another, I think it's the final showcase I want to show here is uh, it's ownership management is another project I worked on at Facebook. Um, so, oh, by the way, this is uh, this is Ada Lovelace. It's one of our cats, and I, I, I forgot to. I'm a very bad person. Um, this is this is our second cat. This is uh, um, this is this is Kathleen uh, Booth, and this is Ada Lovelace. Um, so. Yeah, so she's shown here because she owns us, so um, anyways. Um, yeah, so ownership management is about a problem that each digital asset in an IT company or so a software company should or has the most accountable owner at all times, right? Um, so I'm talking not just about files, I'm talking about deployments, virtual machines, configuration, database schemas, everything, right? Um, Yes, data warehouse, uh, packages, ML, workflows, God knows. And so why, why is it important to have owners for things? I mean, as you might guess, it's good for liability, for security, for privacy, right? Um, and you, you might be surprised to hear, but it's indeed not always the case that everything has a, you know, a really a proper owner. Um, and so there might be actually different kinds of owners that you need to consider, right? Some, some, someone who is, uh, as a person, who is, uh, you know, maybe uh, the first person who should change the, f the artifact and maybe some, something of an on-call team that is responsible for taking care of any problem that might come in, right? And so this, this is an interesting software knowledge analytics problem. Um, because, I mean, it starts here, right? You have all these assets like artifacts, files, um, configurations, database schemas, God knows, right? And, of course, uh, you, you basically want to set up um, an ownership recommendation system, something that says you or this team should be the owner. Um, actually, in some cases, oh, and, and that, should, that should go into a meter store. The meter store should capture the current situation in terms of 
who owns what, right? And actually, the meter store might think that someone owns something, but we might figure out that actually um, this is not the best owner anymore, right? So the idea is that the, this ML-based system would uh, would um, make predictions for the owners, and they would be sugar-coated, and then uh, they you would receive an explainable recommendation. Hey, on-call team X, what about you take care of this ML workflow, right? Because you seem to be the owner, because for example, looking at all the activities um, around this ML workflow or whatever, who uses what goes out of the workflow or what goes into it or whatever, what, what we can see in logs, uh, it looks like you are the best person, okay, or the best on-call team. Yeah, that's the kind of system here. And I mean, it's, it's really about very heterogeneous extraction from all kinds of different artifacts. Um, extracting stuff from all kinds of logs of different systems that were not made to work together. Um, and then some labeling because we need to know, of course, some strong, strong cases of uh, um, ownership uh, evidence, right? Yes, and then compile um, recommendations. And there are, there are many problems with it, I think. I will not go too much into these problems. You can imagine it's difficult. Uh, <laughs> and there's a there's a paper that goes with it. Um, and this is maybe uh, all the showcases that I wanted to start with. Now I wonder, should I do the principles now or should we have a break now? Okay, well, you tell me. Okay, all right. Yeah, so th this is this is a list of principles of software uh, knowledge analytics, and I, I I think it's nothing really surprising. It's just like if I want to make sense of the world, as I said, then I have this all of this in mind, right? I mean, it's very important for us to spend time on hypothesis building. I mean, figuring out the right hypothesis, coming up with the right underlying theory, turning this into research questions, making this whole stuff uh, falsifiable. Um, data extraction and integration. Yeah, Much of our business as software knowledge analysts is about um, getting uh, the data from all the different sources and integrating it in appropriate ways. Then much of our work today is about mathematical modeling, right? Uh, maybe some regression, uh, we'll say more about this. And then, uh, to some extent, we also apply logical reasoning. Uh, for example, when we use description logic or data log style. Um, and then, more recently, we also think more about using metadata in the data in the knowledge graph that, that we work on. And m maybe quite importantly, um, I call it continuous replication. That, that's a very strong requirement. So. Um, it's it's a bit more than what people call replication. I will say something about this. Yeah, I mean, here are my favorite hypotheses. The greater the number of software engineers per square meter in a country, the smaller the ratio of failing to succeeding software projects in a country. Okay, Haskell programmers perform better to in web programming than C programmers. Okay, I mean, you, you guys uh, have probably seen lots of hypotheses. You know how to classify them. And uh, um, so let's not... Let's not spend too much time on this. So, of course, interesting thing is that hypotheses at some point tend to talk about variables, right? And it, it, it turns out we have independent variables, right? like the cause, right? The dependent variables, what we think of as the effect. Observed variables, right? That things that we can measure. Unobserved variables that we, that we cannot measure, but we sort of assume, you know, they exist. And then there are identified variables, you know, where we use some uh, mathematical modeling or otherwise to, to compute them, right? Um, so, yeah, so, and we will, we will see more of this. Data extraction and integration uh, comes in many forms, right? Scanning, parsing, static analyze, dynamic analysis. Uh, at some point, some NLP kicks in. We might scrape data from somewhere. Right, and then when it comes to integration, it might be as simple as performing joins, uh, but we might also need to 
convert the data because they use different data types or different underlying meter models, uh, locking schemes, God knows. Or we need to do something like ID recovery, right? Uh, what I was mentioning in the process mining context, uh, work item prediction. Uh, we, we sort of need to figure out some missing labels, right? And we might also add metadata or we might um, impose some traceability links, for example, when we do feature location, right? Okay. And then mathematical modeling, uh, that's really cool. Um, so, for example, we might use uh, logistic regression um, uh, for, for, yeah, uh, on, on observed variables, right, to identify some more variables. Or we might uh, um, provide some confidence interv intervals for the identified variables, right? How confident can we be that this uh, logistic regression model is uh, faithful, right? Or we come up with n-grams for language corpuses, Bayesian models, decision trees, and actually also performance models for ML models. Sounds a little bit like meta level, but they are also mathematical models, right? Like with accuracy, F1, and stuff like that. Um, next principle, logical reasoning, right? Um, so, like when you are more in a semantic web kind of context, uh, I've been working on this lately, uh, last few years, a lot, uh, you know, your tool is description logic, so OWL, and your logic engine is, is a reasoners, right? Basically, you infer more things from known triples, let's say. But there's also the data log style, right? Uh, also sort of deductive, right? So also quite powerful application. Or, or you have a more like verification kind of approach, right? So you use logic to describe things that should be true, and you, you, you try to verify it, right? Or use constraint systems in some implementations, for example, of language processors, which is also logic. Um, and then semantic metadata. Uh, this is really about uh, when we extract and integrate our data, we might uh, impose ontological classifiers and relationships on the data, right? We didn't do this like 20 years ago, I mean, I'm a little bit careful because probably we did it five or ten years, certainly ten years ago or so. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's about really abstracting from, from the specific data representation and coming up with um, an ontology of uh, the, the software domain. Um, traceability links are also metadata, obviously, or we might deal with uh, versions, with variants, with scopes in our knowledge graphs, right? Or we might assign truth values to certain statements, uh, or we might uh, uh, quote sources from where we actually, which is also some sort of traceability link, right? So just for fun, a uh, little example here, um, just to show you a tiny metadata bug uh, on Wikidata. So this is uh, this is about the book, The Art of the Deal. Um, and it's it's obviously a book. It's a li it's a literary work. I mean that's the type, right? And then there are different statements about who is the author of uh, the art of the deal. I mean, is it Donald Trump? Uh, is it is it Tony Schwartz? So actually, the, the New Yorker, which is a m magazine, uh, disputed certain ownerships here. Um, so so let's let's see. Exactly. Um, so this is this is what we had on Wikidata, like um, that the New Yorker st stated Donald Trump is an author, but that was not that was not true. Actually, what we had here is that the dispute of authorship was stated in the New Yorker, right? So there's some some meta meta uh, data problem going on here and then maybe the last um, the last principle here is uh, continuous replication I mean replication as we know in a narrow sense uh, and sometimes simply just called reproducibility uh, is, is basically that we go and try to validate the existing analyzers I mean the methodology and maybe the artifacts that implement the analyzers and also we validate the interpretation of the results, right? Um, did, they, did they 
draw the wrong, sorry, the right conclusions from, from the data. But then we also have this replication in a broad sense. Um, so this is, means we try to use the same methodology, but we try to use different data. For example, we try not to use the same repositories, right? Um, and ultimately, we also have generalized replication, right? That we try to use maybe a, a different procedure and try to see whether you know the result is robust, or, uh, even when we try a different procedure using maybe different uh, models. Um, I think I think what we ultimately really want for uh, software knowledge analytics is that that we have continuous replication. I mean, by this I mean it's not like uh, someone writes a MSR paper and then puts somewhere the download link for for all these things, and then you know if someone has enough time, uh, they, they can make it work, right? Um, no, it should be more like if these things are important enough, they they should be alive, right? So. And it should also be easy enough to, to um, adjust them so that they uh, generalize, right? So that I can and that I can play with the sampling or whatever. So this is this is I think where we want to know, and this is how we how we should or to some extent already do fight the replication crisis. And this is maybe good time for a bio break because then I can talk about the challenges in the last part. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we were covering the showcases and just this short list of principles. And now I want to uh, go into some challenges. I mean, I don't necessarily think of all of these things as, you know, big challenges that need to finally be addressed um, in order to... Uh, uh, for software knowledge analytics to become a matured field. It's more like these are challenges that we that we generally and uh, repeatedly face. And, you know, we have, for some, we have solutions, or maybe it's not yet the best solution, maybe not the most general solution, but generally uh, we are always running into challenges like this. So the first I call handling weak data. Um, so, so weak data, by this I mean that uh, the data is not as good as we want it, right? So, for example, our observing variables, which on, on which grounds we then build mathematical models, they might involve some uncertainty. So, the, the instance of the problem that I want to discuss here is uh, linking bug fixes to bug-inducing changes, you know, Experts will notice by the name SZZ. Um, so, so the idea is, like here, you have some, uh, you have some bug, right? And there's some commit that fixes the bug. So, and now you want to know what commit early on kind of induced the bug, right? I mean, of course, you can. Um, ask people to uh, label the data, uh, but even then we are not sure that they are doing the right thing. So, so you, want to, you want to use some uh, heuristic or whatever to find the commit early on that induced the bug. And being able to do that, being able to identify bug-inducing commits is useful for all kinds of things, and that's the so-called SZZ paper here. So they, they were sort of going with a funny uh, use case. They said, you know, when do changes induce fixes? So they figured out they could show that changes committed on Friday would be more likely to induce bugs, right? But this is just one application. I mean, once you know what commits induce bugs, you can do many other things. I will also mention one later on, and I'm pretty sure some of the people in the room know these things, right? Um, but there's, there's obviously a problem with this, and this is what I call weak data. I mean, um, okay, the most simple problem would be, okay, um, do we really know that something fixes a bug? Uh, but okay, that's probably easy enough if we, if, you know, we have good enough labeling in, in, our, in our system, in, in some repositories, that's certainly the case. Um, um, 
Uh, but I mean, this this bug fix might be a slightly bigger commit where we do other things out of necessity, right? So what part of the commit fixes the bug? Maybe there's some parts that are not really related to bug fixing. And now the more interesting question is, when was that part changed in the past, right? Because if you can find that place in time, um, and that's called the mapping problem, right? Then, um, well, then we have found the commit that induced the bug, right? And so, yeah, there might be some things that are spurious. So, and then what are people doing in this kind of case? Uh, they come up, I mean, there's actually a lot of surveys on SZZ improvements, right? It's sort of funny. I mean, every respected uh, researcher uh, has written an SZZ follow-up paper. I, I, I didn't actually. Anyone has written an SZZ paper here in the room? Okay, sorry. I mean, some self-respected researchers write uh, SZZ follow-up papers. Um, and so, you know, they deal with all the issues, right? I mean, um, especially the mapping problem, like how do I, f you know, because, I mean, the code might change in between, right? I might do some refactoring in between, but this is not when the bug was induced. That would be stupid to blame this refactoring as inducing the bug, right? So I need to map through this refactoring and find really the place where this bad code was written. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, uh, it's it's terrible. And there's, there's a completely different kind of um, weak data so if you think about weak uh, supervision, as in the context of supervised machine learning, right? This is uh, exactly uh, it's a good case of weak data because, you know, there's noisy data, there's maybe not enough data, right? And uh, it's, it's imprecise, yeah, because uh, some measurements are going on. And so we also have to deal with that, right? Especially in a supervised machine learning context. And actually this... Um, this problem I was showing earlier with the um, work item prediction uh, has exactly that problem, right? Because as I said, uh, you have this dark matter and the dark matter is like, it's, it's weak data, right? So you don't, ex you don't know exactly what work item it's about, right? So, so you need to use the limited amount of somewhat reliable labeled data to build some model and, and, and sort of compensate for the lack of uh, the other data, right? Also very common. Um, another challenge I want to briefly cover is uh, scaling for evolving data. I mean, uh, we all are used to big data these days, right? We all use MapReduce and France for all kinds of problems. That's certainly also true in software knowledge analytics. Um, but um, the problem is that many problems in, for example, mining software repositories deal with extra huge amounts of data, especially because you also need to track the evolution, right? Um, and um, this, this naturally calls for some sort of incrementalization, right? But that's not how everyone is doing it necessarily, right? I mean, there's this some research on this. Um, but so, for example, here, assume that you want to uh, go over an entire repository and understand the um, the McCabe complexity uh, evolution of all the files, right? How would you do this in, in a naive way? Uh, you, you iterate over all commits, you, you materialize all files, right? You compute the, the matrix on all the files and you somehow compose the per file or whatever um, findings, right? I mean, this is obviously a bad idea, but it's not so easy to do this better than that in a more general case, right? I mean, I think many of us will immediately think, okay, I should somehow not materialize all these files all the time. I should probably do something with the diffs, the plus and the minuses, right? Uh, but how does this generalize to, I mean, here we have McCabe complexity. How does this generalize, right? So we were also looking into this problem a little bit uh, not so long ago, but generally the idea is that uh, some people have come up with cool language extensions or maybe on top of MapReduce or otherwise uh, that have some domain-specific iteration constructs to, to make these things more efficient, right? And so w what we have done is um, 
we we have we have applied a more algebraic approach. So I was an early fan of MapReduce, and I realized that you know it uses very um, elementary algebra there, right? I mean, it basically uh, uses uh, um, semigroups, right? So it basically, in order to compose the results that come back from um, from MapReduce, you just need uh, uh, maybe you don't even need associativity in general. In some cases, you can do without. But uh, and so so the trick here was in order to deal with these deltas. Um, for 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 the evolution in the in the commit history, what what you would need is you would need abelian groups, right? I mean, basically groups with commutativity and inverse and stuff. And then in order to combine these deltas, you would need what's called group homomorphisms. And that was sort of cool if you if you build a framework of abelian groups uh, and and group homomorphisms, then you can generally deal with uh, these uh, incremental issues nicely and you also add a little bit of memorization to it anyways um, and so this was really cool so this is this is our implementation here and it beats all the competing technologies uh, where some of them I mean this is like the naive approach and this this is a uh, optimized approach which is and this these, these other approaches here um, while they they use some mix of memorization and some mix of incrementalization, sometimes hand-coded, and so you see uh, with some nice algebraic structure you can do some wonders. Uh, another challenge uh, I want to uh, talk about is ontology engineering. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of propose that we should all think more about knowledge graphs, right? We should sort of add um, ontological classifiers and relationships on, on our data so that we better understand what this all means so that we can maybe apply logic-based reasoning to infer more artifacts. Sounds all great. Um, problems, of course, um, like in other domains, ontologies or even taxonomies, they don't just fall from heaven, right? So you, you somehow have to develop them, right? You have to do some engineering, as it's called, to 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 get them to validate them um and so i think this is uh this i mean other people also have tried to build ontologies in a software engineering context um so i want to give an example here we were interested in software languages and how they are used and when i say software languages i really mean in the most general way not just programming languages but also modeling languages or languages implemented through xml or json what have you um, and usage means you know the technolo technologies that go with these languages right i mean like maybe uh, object relational mapping um, query languages um, so so we were wondering because we saw that several people are sort of addressing the same problem uh, and so we were wondering, so what are really the entity types that you need in this context? And what are the relationship types that you need in this context? And also, can we, can we be somewhat formal about what these relationships mean so that we don't only have like their names, but we sort of have a you know, reference specification? And then also how to, how to find these, these instances, right? So we have all these projects with exercise in different languages and technologies and how do we find all the ent uh, entities and relationships so for example what we did is um, we did sort of a literature survey looking at all the paper that seemed to do some sort of software language ontologies and then we tried to integrate them and figured out okay there's really a, uh, a recurring set of entity types that show up throughout the literature right so they sometimes talk of an artifact, you know, something like a, I don't know, XML input um, or, you know, Java file. Uh, they talk about functions, you know, maybe something like a model transformation defines a function, right? Uh, they talk about records, things that are sort of grouped together. Um, and they talk about systems, obviously. Um, right the, the system that's implemented by a repository 
Yeah, they talk about technologies, uh, different model transformation technologies, different uh, persistence technologies, different queried engines, right? They talk about languages, um, some other resources. They talk about fragments. Sometimes they look into parts of artifacts because these parts are particularly important, right? So, for example, you have a Java file and you look into the place that has some annotations that seem to uh, describe the mapping of the classes to some database, right? So this is a fragment that has some important role, right? And then they talk, well, we tend to collect things, right? Like we have a bunch of files or... Uh, and we also might have traces that, that uh, describe or that capture how a system is executed. And then concepts that are not digital, these are just things uh, we talk about like a design pattern, a uh, uh, model view controller as a concept, right? Um, and then there's usually some stuff that is not really used across different resources, uh, different sources, and so it's under others. So this this is sort of interesting. With just a, a manageable amount of major entity types, w we can understand software language and software technology usage. But obviously, you know, this is this is a um, never-ending process, right? Also because there might be subtypes of these entity types that might emerge and that might turn out to be particularly interesting. So it's it's always a challenge, but we kind of try to solve the problem up to that point. And in the same way, we also try to understand um, what are the relationships that, that seem to be uh, discussed in all these papers that try to understand uh, software systems uh, ontologically. And of course, conformance pops up, right? Uh, some artifact conforms to some other artifact, like a model conforms to a meta model, right? But this is uh, valid across technological spaces. Or we have a definition, right? For example, a grammar, uh, maybe an antler grammar in a file defines a certain language, right? Uh, correspondence, right? There are two artifacts that can be sort of linked at a fragment level I in the sense that their structure seems to um, expose some level by level or part by part correspondence. We have the implementation relationship. I was already using it. You know, some artifact implements some language. Usage is sort of a less formal dependence, right? Um, and membership. You know, obviously, in a set theoretic sense, for example, uh, some artifact might essentially be an element of some language, right? Um, yeah, and some some more stuff. Okay, again. Um, so, yeah. So we also found that you know these different papers they they seem to agree on some um, important relationship types, and so then we then we try to engage in a logical specification to better define what these memberships, or in this case, what membership means or what these other relationships mean. And I don't know, how many people in this room uh, know Jean-Marie Favre? Okay, not too many. Um, I mean, he's, he's not very active these days, but uh, Many years ago, he was uh, really providing deep insight into what's called MEGA modeling. I mean, understanding software at, at this, uh, it's not meta level, right? It's, it's different. It's, these are models where, for example, um, models are elements in, right? So, it's a, but a, a again, let's not go too much into MEGA modeling, but so he was always drawing this triangle. So. So he's basically, he was uh, also together with Jean Bézévan, he was explaining by now the trivial relationship between conformance and membership. So, so for example, think of the thing down here as a model and think of this down up here as the meta model. So obviously the model should conform to the meta model. And that's where usually uh, the early meta modelers stopped. They were just so happy about their models and their meta models, and they talked about conformance. And then people like Jean-Marie Favre, and maybe also me, we, we, we said, no, this is conceptually incomplete. There, 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 there should be something like a, 
a language, and by the way, actually, a grammar as much as a meter model also has a generative semantics, right? So it, in some way, it, it generates all the elements, and that set is a language. So, so you know, this is this is how we can how we can define the meaning of some of these relationships. So here we basically say, um, so what does it mean? Uh, so when we have that something is an element of some language, well, something is an element of something, then that something is an artifact, and L is a language, yeah? And also, uh, here we also exactly capture this uh, relationship between definition and conformance and element of, okay? And similar things can be done for other situations anyways. So that's, that's one part of the ontological foundation of software language and technology usage that leads to better knowledge graphs and software knowledge analytics. But actually it's also pretty difficult to even at the most basic layer to know all the instances of uh, general um, entity types. So for example, you would say, oh, it should be fairly straightforward to know all the programming languages or all the software languages on universe. And actually something like Wikipedia or some other source should be uh, quite easily usable to get this list. I mean, it's actually amazing. So we did the exercise. So we tried to build uh, a rather comprehensive um, set of software languages using Wikipedia and other sources. Um, I will mention those other sources also in a second. So what we did is, okay, here for example, I mean, you, don't, you can't see the details, but this is the Wikipedia page of MATLAB. And just to point out some problems, it's a, a multi-paradigm numerical computing environment and proprietary programming language, right? And then there's some uh, info box here, typing discipline, dynamic week. So actually, problem is this page is, um, this is about an, an environment and a language. It's not just about a language, right? And then look at uh, all the different categories here. Okay, luckily we also have categories, software modeling language. So this probably goes somewhere up to, um, computer language or something like that. Sounds good, right? But we can certainly not include all these different categories here to find all possible languages. Anyways, what, what we did is, um, we started from the Tiobe index of programming language, you know, which s sort of uh, defines popularity of a good bunch of programming languages. Also GitHub has some list of known languages. So that was our seed set. And then we also did a questionnaire um, where we uh, asked people to judge whether something is a software language or not, uh, you know, by random sampling and then getting multiple answers per language to be able to cross-validate. And then we built uh, a feature matrix where we put in everything that you can find on, on these Wikipedia pages, such as the info box, template names, URL patterns of the wiki, uh, PDR URL. Uh, we also did some NL NLP stuff, like we tried to find some lemmas in the summary of the Wikipedia page, like, you know, when it says uh, MassLab is a language, right? Um, and other stuff, I mean, also um, categories and, and listing on um, Wikipedia lists. And then we built a decision tree classifier and uh, also applied small because it's really an uh, unbalanced problem. There's many more things that, that seem to be uh, viable candidates for software languages, but are actually not. Yeah, and then so this way we built uh, a model to somehow get um, all the viable software languages. And now you can imagine that needs to be done even more complicated fashion if you also want to um, consider language classification or when we want to support other entity types other than software languages. Right, um, and next challenge I want to talk about um, is knowledge graph population. So I think some of the examples that I gave 
also somehow struggled with this challenge. So I just want to give another illustration. So, um, so in this case, we want to build knowledge graph of how model transformations are, bi are used in open source projects. So, I mean, intuitively, this starts like this. Okay, if we, if we want to capture model transformations in a knowledge graph, okay, we need to find all the models, the input models, the output models, the model transformations, maybe some tooling around running the model transformations, different model transformation engines, right? So that's the kind of ontology we should uh, uh, develop here. And then by looking for evidence in the, in the projects in how these models, model transformations and technologies show up, we would populate the knowledge graph, right? And uh, by understanding how these technologies work, for example, how the application of a model transformation is coded, maybe in a ARN script or in uh, idiomatic Java code, um, we would be able to draw links between these artifacts uh, so that we know, okay, this is input model, this output model, and stuff like that. So this, this, uh, um, this can be done, of course. So again, we have like on the left, we have like the file explorer view on some model transformation project. And uh, it happens to be an ATL project, ATL being one uh, favorite model transformation technology, which also involves uh, some launch description and, um, well, some, some extra XML artifacts and uh, some UML stuff here, some meta model. Yeah, so, so basically this has been recovered automatically. Um, and I gave you, uh, earlier on I gave you a similar example where we were dealing with the EMF patterns, right? And where I showed you that uh, you can use uh, some logic-based um, um, inference there to get basically entities, well, and especially relationships. I mean, something like this we also did here. Um, and so, yeah, applied heuristics, it, it's again like some, some, some kind of rules that we used in order to find more and more relevant entities and more and more relevant relationships. But uh, in terms of this challenge of populating the knowledge graph, I want to point out one really simple idea that we, that we used here in order to know whether we are making progress. Because, you know, when, when, when do you know whether the knowledge graph is good enough, right? I mean, how do you decide that? So, so what we what we did is, um, given a project, we would try to uh, discover more and more nodes, right? I mean, more and more entities that we can explain, right? For which we have a entity type, right? And more importantly, we would also want to discover more and more ages, more and more relationships between all these things, but. Even more importantly, we would like to bring down the number of dangling nodes, things that we know that are sort of relevant to the domain, like model transformation, but we don't really know why they're on the project and what's going on with them, right? So, so we basically, you, you want to get down with this number, obviously. I mean, relative, of course, to, 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 to that number, right? Um, I mean, sounds simple enough, but that's, that's one, one of the tricks you use when you populate knowledge graphs, okay? And here you also see how, you know, through the iterations of developing more and more rules or heuristics for uh, entity and relationship identification, um, the, the number of nodes would initially go up a lot, and, and initially because we would focus on uh, entity uh, identification, uh, all these things would be dangling. And then, you know, eventually we might find some more things, um, but eventually the dangling uh, edges would go uh, down. And um, yes, well, that's sort, of, that's sort of the lesson learned here. And that's the last challenge I want to talk about. Um, so it's about managing threats to validity. 
Um, that's that's a rec very recent paper. I actually do be presented this or next week. I mean, this week virtually at MSR, and then some time later, maybe physically. Um, so, I mean, that and that's the stuff that uh, Kuhn wants uh, maybe a full presentation on. I, I hope I can do that. So, yeah. So it's it's really about threats of validity that we're all aware of when we do uh, mathematical models. Um, we, we need to describe maybe some confidence intervals, we, we give some accuracy or some F1 score or whatever. Uh, we try to uh, quantify, you know, how well our methodologically generalizes um, for other uh, data sets we try to quantify how well our sampling works and stuff like that, right? And it, it's pretty it's pretty difficult to do this completely systematically, right? So just to give you here an example, so so the idea here is that we try to come up with a simulation or debugging idea in order to play with these threads and to see whether the assumptions that we are making uh, you know, in relation to these threads, whether these assumptions, you know, whether by simulation of of uh, our mathematical model, we we can sort of either dismiss this thread, sort of, or maybe we can show that it under certain conditions it might lead to a problem. So, simple example here. So we have a software defect analysis that we want to debug. Software defect analysis relates again to SZZ we were talking about earlier, right? So, so you basically want to predict whether a certain commit, in this case, based on uh, on lines of code, for example, um, uh, leads to a defect, right? So actually, the finding here uh, there's, there's a there's a paper that we picked up and we tried to basically debug, right? Uh, the finding is, yeah, we do a logistic regression model, and we 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 d we just assume that such a model is appropriate here, and then we find some intercept and slope, and because the slope is positive, apparently yes, if LOC goes up, uh, the commit is more dangerous. Okay, but I mean, of course, we just identify this intercept and slope, and we we it's it's a uh, it's an unobservable variable, right? So we don't know the real intercept and slope of, of this logistic regression. So then, okay, what's, what can people do? I mean, it's, this is a very simple model. In the paper, there are more complicated models. Okay, they, they might do something as simple as, um, uh, yeah, they, they might try to find a confidence interval by maybe running this um, with different, slightly different data sets. But what we do here is much different. So basically, we go and try to replace some of the data around here with synthetic data. And we try to see whether the synthetic data still leads to similar results. If it does, it's sort of nice because it means there are no strange hidden variables going on in our uh, real data. Um, that maybe just lead to a result. Uh, we should be able to get the same result with synthetic data. Also, we might be able to actually compute uh, unobservable variables. We, we, might, we might exercise different unobservable variables in our synthetic data. So we might be able to do many simulation runs, which is not really possible with, with you know, the original methodology because we just have one data set with a non-attainable, uh, unobservable data, and you know we can just compute uh, these things. Maybe we can define a confidence interval, but not much more. So, okay, to make it more concrete, so what we do is we just go for different data. So we keep x. What was x? X was the lines of code metric. For so this is the observable uh, variable for lines of code metric. So we put in our alpha and beta as we identified it with the original methodology. So this is the th these are the parameters of the logistic regression model. Now we just run logistic regression inverse. 
So this is basically what logistic regression means in reverse, so exponential function here. We put in alpha and beta. So this gives us a probability distribution. Um, a probability distribution for defects, okay? And uh, that's interesting. We never had such a probability distribution in the original methodology because the original methodology only has binary defect classification, right? So this is something that conceptually exists or we assume it exists because otherwise we couldn't apply logistic regression, but we don't have it for the real data. We only have it's either defect or not a defect. And this step we do here, right? So now we compute a new defect data. We just use binomial uh, distributions or we just, you know, it's just a random number generator that uh, obeys th this probability uh, distribution. And by this, we have defect data comparable to what we had before. And we made it so that it it obeys the logistic regression parameters that we extracted from the real observed uh, defect data, right? So that's sort of funny. So now we, now we can, what we can do now is we can just pretend that this new Y is as good as our old Y, and we can uh, again run the original methodology on this data, okay? And so, first thing we do is, okay, we just try to compute again uh, intercept and slope. And sort of, you know, looks good enough, uh, very close, very close, right? So this is what, what people call correspondence. Um, just, you know, usually people say, okay, this is good enough, I trust this, right? Um, but then we, then we say, hmm, but it's not the same. How come it's not the same? It's not, why is it not exactly the same? Um, and the reason why it's not the same is essentially because we now have this extra unobserved, but by now observed, parameter for the probabilistic distribution, th which, which conceptually we also have in the first case, but it's not in the data. So it's just, you know. Um, so so, which means if we, if we run this simulation several times, we get different probability distributions. So, we get, we get the same probability distribution, but we get different random number generators. And by this, we get different defect data. And this defect data doesn't fit equally well in all the cases on the, on the logistic regression model, obviously, right? And then we can even push it, we can say, hmm, it, and parameterized testing is about generalizability of, of this methodology, right? We can say, uh, what if we assume that maybe different languages come with different um, parameters, right? I mean, in terms of defect analysis. So maybe for, maybe for Haskell, it's, it's it, you really have to have lots of extra lines of code to have an, another defect, right? Whereas in uh, Smalltalk, right? Smalltalk is pretty easy. You just add one line, 10 more defects, right? So, uh, <laughs> so um, I mean, obviously this was not addressed by the initial study, but it still claims it's obviously a good idea to do logistic regression. And yeah, if someone has enough Smalltalk code, then they can figure out, right? Um, so we, we can actually simulate this, right? We can actually play with alpha and beta because we can put it into this program. And by this, we can see whether this methodology as such performs well, you know, across these alpha beta ranges. And just to give you an idea, so here, for example, we run simulation 100 times. Um, and by this, you see, we get actually uh, quite a confidence interval-like information here on what um, alphas and what, uh, sorry, what intercepts and what slopes we would get for these different simulation runs, right? So this is, uh, and I mean, this is sort of, this shows a thread, right? This, this basically shows the thread that because we committed to logistic regression, um, 
and it, uh, it, it and it it has basically this hidden probabilistic uh, distribution. Um, this might not be the best possible model, right? Or here, uh, we cover different alphas and betas, I mean intercepts and s uh, slopes, and we see basically when uh, both of these parameters get either very small or very big, then uh, this whole methodology uh, becomes highly unreliable, right? And we can easily see this. Right, so this is uh, almost at the end of my presentation. So I've shown you a bunch of showcases, uh, uh, some principles I want to hold dear, and some challenges that we encounter time and again, and hopefully we find uh, better and better uh, approaches. And indeed, um, in the rest of the week, I want to drill deeper on some of these topics and look really forward interacting with uh, the students of the department, because um, I guess I will learn more from you than you from me, but that's okay, that's why I'm here. Uh, yes, so that's it, and of course I will highly appreciate some discussion and some comments and questions. Thank you. <laughs>